Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy this morning as we continue to uh, go through this series that we've entitled In God We Trust, uh, learning what it means to trust God not only with our eternal salvation but also with all of our life, with our possessions, with our money, with our family, with our jobs, all the different things that we uh, find ourselves worrying and being anxious about. God has called us to uh, put our faith and trust in Him, knowing that He is a great God. And what we're learning is when we put our trust in other things, we'll be filled with all kinds of anxiety. We'll be filled with all kinds of worry because things of this world struggle to live up to the expectations we want. They many times will fail us, but as we've learned earlier in this series, that we have come to realize that God is utterly faithful. He is completely trustworthy in taking care of us and ministering uh, to us in our times of need and in our times of plenty. And so we have been, being, been continually reminded that we are to place ourselves into the loving hands uh, of God, remembering that He will take care of us. Now, as we now move and pivot, as we did last week, to the subject of money, it is very easy for us as a people to make money an enemy, to say that money's the problem. Uh, many have taken the Scripture uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 6, and they've said money is the root of all evils, but that's not what the Scripture says. It says that the love of money is the root of all evils. And yet we begin to think that the money we have in our hands, the money we have in our possessions is the problem. And money isn't the problem. We're the problem. You see, money is amoral. Money can be used to hurt people. Money can be used to exploit people. Money can be used in dishonest and deceitful ways. But likewise, money, that same money that's in your pocket that can be used to create so much destruction can bring such delight when given in the right ways. Money is a way to show affection and, and generosity on one hand, and yet you can also destroy the lives of others. And so we need to recognize this morning that money's not the problem. We are. We are the one that messes up this money, this gift that God has given this morning uh, to us. And we need to recognize this morning that we need to get this money thing down. We've learned over and over again that for whatever reason, money as it was in the first century and is today, money is somewhere where we run to when we're struggling with what to do. Money is a great enemy of God in the sense that we run to money to fix our problems instead of running to God. It's a competitor. And God never intended for money to be that. Money is a gift and it's a grace that God has given so that we can provide for our family, so we can be generous with people, so we can enjoy the creation God has given us. But man has used money and elevated it to a place that God never intended for it to be. And this morning we come uh, to a passage of Scripture that speaks numerous times throughout the book of 1 Timothy on the subject of money. And today we're going to look specifically at what it has to say to you and I. Now, the book of 1 Timothy is a book that's written by the Apostle Paul to his disciple, to his spiritual son Timothy, who's pastoring a church in the city of Ephesus. Timothy's a young man. He's new at pastoring. And Paul has written this letter to tell Timothy, hey, this is how you organize a church. This is how you deal with the circumstances and the struggles that come along with being a pastor of a church. Here are things you need to be teaching the people of God so that they live upright and holy lives so that they will be salt and light in the world. And money comes up as a recurring theme over and over and over again in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. Paul tells Timothy that, Timothy, you've got to appoint leaders for any church to be a real church, it needs shepherds. It needs uh, men who serve under uh, the lordship of Jesus Christ, whose job is to care for and tend to the flock uh, of Jesus Christ in a local church. And, and that's why we believe in, in the role of elders, just as Timothy was to appoint elders. And Paul tells Timothy, don't appoint an elder who's a lover of money. You see, you can't love the church and love money at the same time. And so he says, when it comes to your spiritual leaders in your flock, Timothy, be careful that, that your elders aren't greedy men, that they're not all about money, but they're about the kingdom work of God. 
And then that same chapter, he talks about deacons, those who direct the ministries and the affairs of the local church and, and uh, are servants. And he says, listen, don't appoint a man who is out for dishonest gain who thinks that by elevating, being elevated in the church and its ministry, that it's going to mean money in his pocket. He goes on in chapter 5 and he says, listen, we as people in our families, we need to provide with money the financial needs of those around us, especially in our immediate biological families. And he talks specifically to widows and Paul says, listen, Timothy, if there's a widow in your church who's struggling, uh, don't let the church take care of it. Start with the family. And then he shares this. He says, if a man does not provide financially for his biological family, he is worse than an unbeliever. Literally, a litmus test is how generous are you with your family when they find themselves in need. And then in chapter 6, where we'll find ourselves today, Paul talks all about the issue of money. In chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, he talks to the poor people of the congregation, the people that were continually wondering, where am I going to get my next uh, meal? Where am I going to spend the night tonight? Where am I going to get new clothes? And he says to them, be careful, don't become lovers of money. And don't think that, that your life will be all put together if you became rich, because when you start thinking that way, you make yourself susceptible to all kinds of get-rich-quick schemes. And there were false teachers in the church at that time who were saying that God and money were so connected that just as we see false teachers today, that holiness and a faith-filled life will produce large amounts of money. You turn on television today and you see TV preachers saying the same thing. And he says, listen, I don't want you to be uh, hungry for riches because in doing so, so many have fallen into ruin pursuing riches. And so he says, listen, the love of money is the root of all evil. And he says that to poor people, people who are looking for their daily bread, people who are looking for their next piece of clothing. And then he goes on and he says, Timothy, I want you to flee all of this stuff as a pastor, be so very, very careful that you don't become a money guy. Make sure that you don't become one who has dollar bills in your, in your eyes and you look at the people of God and the ministry of God as an opportunity to pad your own pocket. Now he says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that it is right and good for the people of God to pay for the labors of a pastor or pastors to do the work uh, that they are called to do. He goes on and he uses the principle, do not uh, muzzle the ox while it's treading. A laborer deserves his wage. And so Paul isn't saying that we shouldn't be paying uh, pastors to do things, but the goal is, should not be of any pastor, and sadly it is in so many churches today, and sadly in evangelical churches, that ballooning salaries and, and pastors in mansions driving nice cars and wearing all kinds of glamorous clothing has become more the norm than we would ever desire. And so Paul says, be careful of that. Flee that. Make your life a characteristic of all the good qualities of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he comes to the text today and he says, now I want to talk to the rich people. And I want to talk to the rich about some significant areas that you need to grow in your walk with God and warnings that you need to be careful of. And so this morning we come to a book that is a th thematic message about money in the church. And we come to a passage at the very end of this book, verses 17 through 19 of chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, grab that pew Bible. You'll find our passage on page 994. And what we see in these verses, I believe, are two things. We see as he addresses the rich that there are rich people problems and there are rich people priorities. And those are the two headings I want to look at this morning. But let's look at the text and then we'll jump right into uh, the outline this morning. This is what Paul says to Timothy as he closes his letter in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The rich are to do good, 
to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your blessing on our time. We ask for the blessing of the preaching of it. We ask for your blessing on the hearing and applying of this word so that we may know your will and your plan for us with regards to our money. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the money we have and giving us what we need for our enjoyment and for our care. Now, Lord, we humbly place ourselves under your lordship and your teaching this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Some years ago, there was a TV program uh, that came, and it had one job, one goal, and that was to give you a sneak peek on how the other part of the world lived. Not people on the other side of the globe, no, 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 but it wanted to show you how the rich and famous lived. Now, there were programs before it that had sought to do it, but in much smaller realms. They were, they were given to just paparazzi photos and, and some captured pictures of, of how the lifestyles of the rich and famous were. That is until 1985. And in 1985, a program came out, and it ran for 11 years, from 1985 to 1996, led by the debonair host Robin Leach with his British accents. And he began to give us a sneak peek into what it was like to be rich and to be famous. He would go with his cameras, and he would show us where the actors and actresses of Hollywood would live, the titans of industry. He would show us uh, what their houses looked like, what kind of pools and amenities were on their properties. You would see that their garages were filled with all kinds of foreign and domestic cars of luxury. You would learn as to how they would party. You would learn as to how they would live life. You would learn as to where and how they would vacation. And the whole purpose and plan of this was was a bit to get you to start coveting things. You would see how the other part of the world lived, and you'd say, man, sure is nice. I want to live like that. And the goal was, as was articulated in the opening dialogue, was that you too could enjoy champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Hmm, sounds really good, doesn't it? That if you uh, hit it big, you have the opportunity to enjoy all that life affords. And this morning, we have to ask the question as Christians, what does God's Word have to say about our champagne wishes and caviar dreams? Are we somehow in line or out of line with what God wants for us and, and commands of us as followers of Christ? You see, just as it was in the day of Ephesus in the first century, so it is today that the church is divided on the issue of money and the Christian. Just as in Ephesus then and, and today, there are people who would say money is no good. It was called asceticism. And what they would say is that money was no good. You, you only, it was an evil that you only dealt with if you had to. And that you never enjoyed what money could buy. Because money at the heart of it was evil. And there are some today, even men that I respect, that would say that uh, to enjoy money, to spend money on yourselves, knowing that there are people lost and without a Savior, is a selfish thing to do. And, and if you're not giving all of your money to the church and all the money to missions, then you're sinning against God. And there are those in, in the evangelical camp that affirm that and believe that. And I respect them and I I understand where they're coming from, but I think they're wrong. And yet on the other side, just as it was in Ephesus and today, there's materialism. And there are people and there are preachers who would say, get as much money as you can. And money shows that you are a faithful, godly individual. Put all that bling on. And like I said, you turn on the TV and you see these TV preachers. And you will see them announce brazenly that they need to raise, uh, as one guy did in Atlanta, Georgia, he called for his congregation to raise more than $15 million to start orphanages in Africa, to open up wells for water in far off places, no, for his new Lear jets. $15 million. And here's the crazy thing, those dummies raised it. 
And here was his thing. How can I preach the gospel boldly if I have jet lag? Universal sign of disapproval? (laughs) All right? That's nonsense. And yet that is mainstream in our churches today. So what is a Christian to do? Notice, first of all, that when Paul talks about money, he is speaking to a specific group of people. Notice he says, I'm talking to the rich. To those in the text, he says, who are rich in this present age. Now, I want you to recognize being rich isn't a bad thing, nor is it a good thing. The Bible never says, and this text never says, that if you're rich, you're bad, or you're rich, you're good. The Bible says, it's a matter of fact, if you're rich, I've got a word for you. But I want you to notice what Paul says. Paul says that if you are rich, you've got some problems. Because inherent to being rich are problems. The materialistic and the earthly theologian, the notorious B.I.G., put it this way, more money, more problems. And he was right, even though most of what he said was wrong, he was right on that particular argument. But let's be honest this morning, and let's be real, that money does take care of a lot of problems. Uh, Let's be honest, if if money's bought me a house, then I don't have to worry about where I'm going to lay my head. If money has provided me clothes and I don't need to be worried, I'm going to walk around naked. If money has bought me food, then I don't have to worry about where my next meal is going to come. And so what we need to recognize this morning is money takes care of problems. That's why God gave it to us. God gave us money to alleviate problems in our lives. And so as people who have money in this congregation today, there is a whole list and litany of problems you don't ever have to worry about because you're rich. And the people that are poor are dealing with problems that you don't even think about on a daily basis. But when it comes to being rich, being rich has its own issues. It has its own problems. Well, what are some of the problems? I see four in the text this morning. Number one, there's a problem of identity. The problem of identity. You see, rich people struggle with their identity. And you say, well, what do you mean? What what, what does that mean? Notice he says, I want to talk to the rich people. And he says, those who are rich in this present age. And that's just a key reminder. Underline that phrase in this present age. Listen, just because you're rich now doesn't mean you'll be rich in the kingdom and age to come. But right now you find yourself rich. Well, one of the issues that will come up is that when Paul says this to Timothy, and Timothy reads this to his congregation in Ephesus, he says, okay, I want you to command or charge the rich people who are rich in this present age to do some things. And the natural response of people is, well, I'm not rich. I'm not who he's talking about. Well, I'm sure glad next to me in the pew is Richie Rich. He's talking about him. I mean, look at what Richie Rich drives. Look at how he dresses. Look at where he lives. I don't live there. I don't drive that. So I'm glad today that I am at a message or at a service where a message is being preached and I can lean back and enjoy it and say, hey, listen up, buddy. But here's the problem. Rich people very rarely recognize that they are rich. One survey was done, and 85% of people who uh, were rich according to world standards said that they themselves were poor. You see, we have a poverty mentality. We think that no matter what we have, it's never enough. Ask how much money do you need to make to be happy, and every response almost to uh, 100% was just a little more. You see, we think it just if I have a little more, I'll be happy. If I just have a little more, then, then I'll be wealthy, then I'll be rich. Here's the problem. We are rich, and this morning, this passage is for us. Now let me explain, and I'll do so as quickly as I can, but turn your your focus to the screen here, and I've got something that's hard to read, but the global rich list that takes all of the uh, riches of the world, and and it asks the question, well, how rich really am I? And so the first number I'm going to put in, I know it's hard for you to see, is the number 15,000, minimum wage. And as I put in the number 15,000 and say, where do I rank in the world, it tells me. 
If you make minimum wage, you are a part of the 93 top money uh, producers in the world. 93, top 93. That means 7% is richer than you, but 93% of the world is poorer than you. Now let's put another number in. Let's say you're a couple, and both of you are making minimum wage. So we'll change that number, and we'll turn that number to $30,000. Each of you making what is, in essence, what we call the poverty line here in America. Well, what does that do to us in our world's perspective? If we make $30,000 a year, we are in the top 1% of all people in the world. Talk about one percenter, right? 30,000. And uh, you can see that there's still a lot of richer people. 73 million people are richer than you are, but let's remember there's more than 7 billion people on the earth. Let's go to the next one, and we'll see that as we just continue to move up. So then the next question is, okay, so $30,000, that's a pretty good number. Well, let's look at the national average. What's the national average of income? And we change that number to $50,000, which is the U.S. national average of salaries. And what does that do for us? That puts us not only in the top 1%, but the top two-tenths of 1% as the richest people in the world. That means we are the 18th millionth richest person by our income in the world. And we're just average here in America. Listen, that's like saying I have an average house in Bel Air. Now, there should have been a lot more laughter there. (laughs) I live in a shack in Bel Air. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. But that's how we operate here in America. Now, let's bring it closer to home, okay? And hopefully, these are hitting for you wherever you may be. So now, let's take the national average and change that and take the city of Sugar Grove's average uh, which skyrockets from the 50,000 to be 99,600 is what demographics say is the average income in Sugar Grove. What does that do? That moves us to the top uh, 1%, really to the top 99.9% of all wealth producers in the world. Now again, let's put it in perspective. We are still the five millionth richest person in the world But let's remember, there is 6.5 billion people who find ourselves behind. Brothers and sisters, when Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world to have thought about their riches, I'm going to say this in probably the most blanket statement I've ever made, but I think I'm pretty confident in doing so. If you find yourself living in the Fox Valley area, you are one of the rich ones. And so we need to listen. And our identity isn't, hey, I'm glad this is being preached for Mr. Big Bucks next to me, but this needs to be preached to me because though I may be poor by America's standards, in the world's standards, I am rich beyond measure. Beyond measure. So we have an identity issue. Notice next we have a priority issue. The priority issue is we need to be called out for it. Paul says, I want you to charge them. Notice this word charge is a strong word. It's not recommend. It's not suggest. It's not even teach them. Uh, Rather, J. Adams put it this way, to authoritatively instruct. Why would Paul use such a strong word to Timothy? Because I believe that if we are really going to get to the heart of this money issue, we got to use a hammer. Because the world tells us that we're okay. The world tells us that just a little more will do the trick. And Paul says, listen, it is hard to release people from the grasp of their money and making money their God instead of God himself. And so we need to recognize this morning, God has a word for all of us. He says, I've loaned you money, and here are the closing papers on what this money is to be used for. So remember, when you bought your home, you went through a closing, and all of that legalese that that you, you said you read through, right? And you prayed someone did. And so you're signing off, and it's all, listen, this is what you can do with the money, this is what you can't do with the money, and you're signing off. Well, God is saying, I have loaned you money. I have loaned you possessions. And I have a strict plan for how you to live that out. And so I charge you, I command you, when it comes to your money, don't do certain things, but do these other things. Notice third problem. 
The third problem is a humility problem. He says, charge them not to be haughty, not to be arrogant, not to be prideful. Don't let your riches make you think that you're better than you really are. Don't make your riches think that you're better than others. And, and here's the problem. Money produces arrogance many times. And it doesn't mean to, but by nature, money allows you certain things that, that if you don't have it, you sure wish you did. Take for a moment, let's go on a field trip to O'Hare Airport today. And if you have money, you're going to be brought to a special counter because you hold a first-class ticket. And so you're not going to have to stand in that long line in that maze, okay, with all the other cattle of the world. And you're going to walk right up, and they're going to take care of you, and they're going to say, listen, we know poor people smell. We know poor people are loud. We know poor people have way too many kids. And so we don't want you to have to sit in the terminal. There's a lounge for you, Mr. Big Stuff. And go there, and you got free Wi-Fi, and there's drinks, all complimentary. And then listen, we'll tell you at just the right time, we'll call you by name when it's time for you to make your way to the terminal. So you don't spend any more time there than you have to, right? And, and here's the thing, right when you get to the terminal, uh, will Mr. Big Stuff please come up? We're going to put you in your chair first. And he gets up and he smiles. He walks by the chaotic but all family, not even looking. I don't even want to look at that. And he sits down and, and he sits in his chair and his chair is plush. It actually fits the bottom God has given him. When he gets there, there's champagne waiting for him. He gets a nice wash towel to wipe his face from all the filth of the commoners that he's come in contact with. And then here's the great thing. They make you and I walk past them. And so you got to walk by and you got to tell your kids, hey, Luke, your dad's just a pastor and a caterer. Those old days aren't happening for you. So let's get back. We're on the wing this time. Hold on. And they look smart and they look, oh, man, they're enjoying themselves. You're going to end into the seventh level of hell on your trip. And they're going to sleep, God bless them. You see, when you're sitting in that nice chair and you're being cared for, listen, 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 listen. It ain't wrong to ride first class. I, quite frankly, am jealous, and that's next week's sermon, okay? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. But would you agree with me that when you are catered to in that way, it's easy to start thinking, number one, you deserve it, and number two, you and yourself have done something that makes you better. Here's the great thing. Have you ever noticed there's a curtain? We don't even want to see them back there. Close it off, okay? I know I'm going to hear from some of our flyers today, our frequent flyers, okay? Nothing wrong with that, but be careful that your possessions and your riches don't start you, make you think, I'm not one of them. I don't want to be like one of them. There's something less than me. Look at what I've got. Look at what they don't have. And God obviously loves me more. Or God, God has blessed me with more. We've got we to gotta be careful of that. And so there's a humility issue. Do not be arrogant. Number four, he says, don't, don't be haughty, rich people. Okay? And by the way, just as a matter of a point here, haughtiness goes against the very aspect and, and tenor of the gospel. Because listen, Jesus shed the same blood for rich and poor alike. And his blood is no respecter of persons. And his, sin, his, his blood that was shed for sin was shed for rich people's sin and poor people's sin and middle class people's sin. And, and, and listen, the foot of the cross is a place of equality, not first class and coach. Amen? And so humility has to be the name of the game. What, what the Bible says is, listen, in the church, as James says, you can't tell the rich person, here's the nice place to sit. Here's the best place to sit. And poor person, you, you go sit over there. That was a problem in James's church. And what Paul is saying is that should be foreign to any church, any group of Christians. And now he moves on humility to security. That's the final problem. And he says, listen, don't be haughty. 
But then he says, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And so what we need to recognize is one of the tendencies we have is to think that because I have money, I'm secure. Because I have money, I can weather trials. Because I have money, uh, I, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Remember the Bible, Jesus gives us a wonderful story of a rich man who has such an overflowing crop that he keeps building barns and silos to fill it. And, and he just keeps building and building, and, and finally all the building projects are done, all of his possessions are where they need to be, and he sits back on that night and he says, I can eat, drink, and be merry. Life is good. And some of us as rich people can sit back and we say, now we've got this promotion. Now we got this inheritance. Now we don't have any problems. Remember, Notorious B.I.G. says, more problems, more money, more problems. And Jesus said of that rich man that on that very night, his life would come to an end. And though he thought he was going to live in safety and security, his life was going to be called and judgment was going to come. And some of us think that we're secure in our finances, and, and therefore we're, we're all good. But let's recognize this morning that riches don't give security. Only God does. And so maybe this morning you, you feel pretty good about yourself. You feel pretty good about your future because you know what amount of money is in your bank account. You know what your 401k says. But notice that Paul says that be careful because he adds the prefix, the uncertainty of riches. You see, the book of Proverbs says money's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Money has a way of talking, right? Money talks. And you know what it says? Bye-bye. It says it even faster when you have children. And we need to recognize that all things can happen, all manner of things can happen, and if we put our security in money, then we'll be continually watching Jim Cramer on CNBC wanting to know, was it a good day for us or a bad day for us? You see, listen, the poor don't care about the stock market. They don't care if the markets are up or down, bull market, bear market. They don't care. They don't worry about mutual funds. They don't care about investments. They're worried about the next meal. But our security, we begin to think, well, what does my, my, my 401k say? Therefore, I'm secure or not. You see, Paul says, be careful. You're rich and you just don't know it. Uh, listen to God's word. God's got a word for you. Don't be haughty, don't be prideful, don't be arrogant, and don't put your faith, your hope, your trust in the uncertainty of riches. Those are our problems. And some of us need to stop and take stock this morning and ask the question, do I have rich people problems in my life? And some of us need to do some work with regards to it. Now let's pivot. Paul doesn't leave us there. And he gives us some priorities. And there are five priorities that I want to move through very quickly this morning. And the priorities are there, and they're straight out of Scripture, so it's not uh, brain surgery for us to recognize them. But there are some things we are called to do. And again, these aren't suggestions. These are commands. Do these things. Number one, depend on God. Instead of depending on the uncertainty of riches, place yourself, Paul says, in the hands of a faithful God. Now notice right before this text, in verse 15, he says this, this God who is the blessed, who is the only sovereign, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, this God who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, the one who deserves all honor and total dominion, that is the God we need to put our trust in. And what it means is, as we learned a couple weeks ago, we need to trust fall into God's arms. God says, I'm the King of kings, and I'm the Lord of lords. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to fall into my arms, and I want you to depend on me. Why? Because money will fly away. Because possessions will, will rust, and moths will destroy. And everything in this earth is temporal, but God is eternal. God is immovable. God is the only king of the universe. 
and he shouts out to us and he charges the people of God, depend on God who is faithful, not on money that is faithless. And so we need to start with a a whole new paradigm. Yes, God's given me money, but I don't put my riches in it. I don't expect money to do something that it can't do. I don't expect money to bring me happiness and contentment and joy. Only God can do that. I don't expect that uh, money is going to give me my identity because only God can do that. I don't expect that money's going to give me purpose or a plan because only God can do that. And so what we do is we put money in its proper place and we say, God has given me money and it's good to use and I need to be wise with it, but I need to recognize that I worship God alone and trust Him wholly for my life. Number two, depend on God. And then next, what we need to do is we need to delight in his gifts. Notice what he says. He says that we are to trust in God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now he's talking to those who say money's no good, possessions are no good. And so what he's articulating is you can delight in these things. It doesn't make you materialistic. It makes you a receiver of a gift. And so what we are to do is we are to take what God gives us and we are to use it to the best of our abilities. Now, what that means is, number one, how did you get that money? Did you break one of God's precepts to do so? Did you lie, cheat, steal? Well, then God hasn't given you that gift. That's theft. Were you dishonest in your gain? Well, that's dishonesty. But if you can say, listen, I've taken money that I have earned. God has called me to work hard. I've worked hard. I've earned this wage. Then God says, not only are you to provide for your family, but you are to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And that's good. And that's right. Listen, I don't want you going home and burning your house down because you're like, well, pastor told me I can't enjoy this. Enjoy your home. Enjoy your cars. Enjoy your television. Enjoy those things. Don't make them gods, but enjoy them. God has given you these things for your enjoyment. But that doesn't mean that, listen, this is something we tell our kids. That doesn't mean the video game system that God's given you to enjoy, that you play it till all hours of the night, right? that you make a God out of it and you devote yourself to it, that you say no to God and yes to television, where you say no to God's church and yes to a better vacation. God says, I want you to enjoy it, but let's put it in perspective. I've given you something to give, but don't make a God out of it by saying no to all the other things that I've told you to do with your money. So depend on God, delight on his gifts, do good, do good. He goes on and he says that that, uh, God has provided, and we as rich people are to do good, to be good and good, uh, to be rich in good works. And what he's saying is, is okay, in proportion to your riches, don't just be known for the rich guy on the street. Don't be known to be the guy that has all the toys, but be known as the guy or the woman. That not only is rich, that's fine. It's hard to hide wealth. It really is. It is hard to hide wealth. Someone will know about it. But what the Bible tells us is is that what the rich should be known for is not just their wealth, but in the same proportion as their wealth, they should be known that they are people who are doing good. And here's why. Rich people, you and I as rich people, have a great luxury. We don't have to worry about the daily necessities of life. Therefore, we can look to the needs of others. You see, when we're not looking for the cardboard box that we're going to sleep in tonight, or where we're going to get food for the next meal, or, or, or where we're going to find our next pair of clothes, you see, once we get beyond the daily necessities of life, we have a luxury that we can focus in on other people. And that's what Paul tells us to do. Do good and, and, and be active in doing good around good works. These good works don't save you. These good works tell you and tell the world that you are saved. And we're to be rich in those things, active in them. 
Next, we need to divest our assets through generosity. He goes on and he says, be generous and be ready to share. I was catering a, 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 a five-year-old's birthday party some years ago. And I was finishing up the meal and I was inside and kind of closing up the leftovers of the food and they brought out the cake. And uh, they sang happy birthday and the kid blows out the, the candles. And then the kid does the unthinkable and he says, my cake, my cake, and he grabs it and puts it all into his lap. And the mom says, why did you do that? And the kid says, because it's mine. You gave it to me. And the mom said, but the job is to share it with others. You see, what we do as Christian rich people is God has blessed us with all this stuff and we, God places it before you and you take everything and you grab it and you push it up to your body and say, mine, mine. And God said, but wait a minute. I wanted you to cut that cake up into pieces and I wanted you to share that. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get the biggest piece or get the one for me all the icing's on. But let's be careful. God has given us all these things for us to then be generous and to share with others. And we would say, and it was said audibly by others, what a selfish little boy. And yet, what we do not do is we say, oh, they're living the good life. No, you're being selfish. Think about it this way. I know I've got a close, but I've got one more point, but think about it this way. Because this is the great five-year-old birthday cake test. When you get a promotion, when you get a raise, when you get a windfall, when you win the lotto, when you, I don't you shouldn't win the lotto. When, okay? When you get an inheritance, when you get your tax refund this year, is the first thought, listen, this is close to home. If your first thought is, what am I going to do with that money for me? You've got a problem. I've got a problem. Because what you've done is you've taken that cake, oh, this is all for me. Instead of saying, wait a minute, Lord, you've taken care of this, 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 and this. I'm not poor. You've given me opportunity. So more money has come in. Let me turn my eyes off of myself and let me look. God, what gospel opportunities do you have? God, who's in need around me? How can I cut up what you've given so that I can share that with everybody? Because I'll tell you what, there were some sad people they didn't get cake. Caterer was one of them. <laughs> Nothing worse than seeing a beautiful cake and then the kid ruining it all for himself. And God's given you this windfall, a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars, whatever it is, God never expected all of that to be used on yourself. So divest it through generosity. Share with others. Give to the church. Give to ministries. Give to your neighbor. Give to those in need. Take care of people around you by divesting some of that money. Not all of it, but some of it for the kingdom work around you. And finally, don't stop thinking about glory. Paul goes on and he says just very quickly, thus storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that which is truly life. To take a, from another contemporary theologian, Fleetwood Mac, they put it this way, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. And what I want you to do is you close your Bibles, okay, go ahead and do that. As you close your Bibles... Don't stop thinking about glory. And remember that this money that God's given you, you don't get to take it with you. I've done a lot of funerals, and there's no U-Haul trailer behind the, the hearse. You don't get to take any of it with you. And people are going to uh, barter over it and fight over your money. And so what God says is pay it forward and give it to things and, and invest things that have an eternal and future reward. Because in doing so, you will experience what it truly is to experience abundant life in Jesus Christ. Money's a problem for us. Let's realize it. Let's call it out for what it is, and let's see the problems that it can create, and let's turn those problems into priorities where we can start investing in the kingdom of God and in others instead of eating all the cake for ourselves. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you, and I thank you for this time together. 
and for your charge, your command for us. And I pray that we would go and we would look at our own lives, we would look at the way we spend money, the way we collect money, the way we look at money, Lord, and we would ask the question, is it right and good for me to think this way and to act this way? Or Lord, are my eyes too much on me and not enough on you, not enough on others? Thank you for the words that Paul shared with Timothy in the church at Ephesus and how appropriate they are for the 21st century. So take what we've learned today, Lord, and empower us to live differently. Empower us to be rich in good deeds and to do good works so that the world may know that we are changed, not just partly, but all of who we are is changed because we've met Jesus and we've met the God who has given us all that we have. And just like God, we want to be generous with others. And so make us a generous people so that we may, in doing so, experience true and abundant life. We thank you, Lord, and praise you for all that you've done this morning and look forward to what you're going to do in this new week. Send us forth now, Lord, in fellowship, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.